Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at another Alpha Zero game. Alpha Zero has white in this one, again, Stockfish 8. And this is the only game of the Queen's Indian Defense games where Stockfish 8 initially deploys the Queen Bishop to A6. So let's see how play develops. Starts off not looking like a Queen's Indian, but we quickly transpose. And it's on this move 4 where we see bishop a6. c4 struck out. It's a sensitive point. A couple approaches. One, to defend with a piece. Two, to defend with a pawn. Defending with a pawn is not without its weaknesses. And defending with the knight, well, white has no interest in obstructing the bishop. Alpha 0 opts for queen c2. Development, defense. If there's a downside... Connected with this, it's maybe seen in that the queen is no longer uh, observing some d-file squares. This is where black now strikes, hitting at a d4, hitting at the d4 point. d5 ensues, and with this, well, it's a gambit line. White's giving up a pawn for what exactly? Well, we'll see in just a bit. A couple captures first. Materials bounced. Black doesn't win the pawn now as that would lose on the spot, actually, queen e4. Not only is this check, but the queen is hitting both knight and rook. Save the knight, the rook is dead. So, the bishop drops back to the main diagonal. d5 is now hit twice, defended zero. It cannot be defended. Adequately. It seems like you play e4 and things are cool. You kind of shut down the bishop. But e4 could be met with queen e7. This is a very nice double attacking move. What's the double attack exactly? Well, e4 is now hit twice and in a pin. And because of this pin, we revisit this same situation. That being d5 is now hit twice and defended 0. So if knight c3, black can simply take. This is one of the many ways black can, by force, win that pawn. White understands this and simply gets on at this stage with kingside development. Doesn't bother trying to hang on to d5. Bishop g2. Knight takes d5. The fearless piece takes d5. Taking with the bishop eventually allows development with tempo. Don't want to allow the knight to take the bishop, so it's the knight that takes on d5. King is now safe. Queenside development, guaranteed productive move, rook d1, asking the knight a question. It doesn't respond, it doesn't need to. Bishop e7, this knight is indirectly defended. If rook takes knight, knight b4. Hitting the queen once and, and the rook twice. So, what do we have in this position after bishop to e7? Well, I have yet to touch on... Uh, what is the main idea behind this gambit? Uh, well, I don't know if I could say main idea. Mm. There, if there's one key square that white now has available as a result of this gambit, it is the f5 square. There's no longer an e-pawn around to secure this point. This is a square that is more often than not made use of by the king knight, pivoting on h4 and sinking into f5. However, in this game, with this variation of bishop a6 and then returning to b7, trying to distract the queen away from seeing the d-file squares, in a way I feel like alpha zero is trying to demonstrate that this queen c2 move is actually a useful move. And this is where we have the white queen make use of the f5 square. This, I just feel, is such a wonderful move. On the surface, uh, most directly, it questions a strong post on d5. This knight needs to find a new home, right? Now this is a threat, taking with the queen or rook. And it's a nice forward move, right? Just doing a quick comparison, queen positions, white queen is much more active. It's true there's still a lot of traffic on board. 
queen has to proceed with caution, not getting trapped, but there'll be some squares on the king side for the white queen to operate on. The knight needs to find a new home. It decides on f6. But this is short-lived. We now have e4. Notice these guys are still just hanging out on the queen side. White is very quick to question this knight post. All pieces remain on board. That's the other thing to maybe note. You know, you could have maybe seen an early knight c3 and possibly a king knight for a queen knight exchange, but maybe white is, you know, anticipating that you can actually race this pawn all the way up to e5 and cause some type of domino effect, influence the quality of the black pieces. Have to find new squares to to uh to pivot about on and in fact the knight on f6 needs to find a new home now e5 is right around the corner and where will the knight's home be black has h5 in mind that's why we have g6 at this moment preparing to meet e5 knight h5 but this is not without its weaknesses f6 and h6 are vulnerable so the queen drops back keeping a close eye on e4, and a close eye on both weakened squares. Before you could kind of make use of weaknesses in your opponent's camp, you have to first observe them, right? So the queen is observing both f6 and h6, and soon, well, maybe she can make use of those squares, pivot on those squares. Continuing, we now have castles. e5 on board, sure enough. Knight h5, queen g4. Now, I was just saying a moment ago, you're observing these squares. Next, you're, you know, you're ready to then make use of those squares. Why isn't queen h6 played here? Uh, I believe it's related to this bishop to f8 move. It appears that that's like a, an underdeveloping move, but really it's a, it's a, it's a productive move. Uh, this rook would like to play to e8, and the bishop would then like to play to f8. It's a common reorganization, uh, it's a typical reorganization, so that the major pieces can have some influence on the, uh, the e-file. Black can exert some pressure against e5. So placing the queen on h6 may kind of backfire, runs into, you may, you may want to view bishop f8 as a developing move with tempo, in this case, okay, in the game it's queen g4, observing d5, there's also a pin here, I don't know that you can really take advantage of, you know, this pinned pawn, but okay, a couple things to note. Rook e8, knight c3, and uh, queen to b8. So this is actually a pretty interesting moment. Uh, after queen, queen g4, rook to e8, this is a moment where white can win this pawn back could take on d7 with the rook but alpha zero has no interest in simply regaining the pawn why why is I mean, these games are so interesting why why is maybe that not uh why does white not go forward with this um you know there's still all pieces on the board and black has created two serious weaknesses in their camp and meanwhile uh the white king has a very cozy home secured by the bishop in the knight can't say the same about the black side it's a little bit more vulnerable you know knight's kind of on the on the edge here the bishop is not on this g7 square not as cozy a home for team black Taking on d7 may eventually force the queens off the board, right? Rook takes queen, bishop takes queen, and there go the queens, and without the queens, the king is not nearly as vulnerable. White doesn't want to take the pawn, doesn't want to just regain the pawn, because the queens, I believe, will be off the board. Wants to keep the powerful piece aboard. So, knight c3, queen b8. Knight d5, it doesn't get much 
Much better than that, right? Knight c3, knight d5, fantastic square, eyeing up a weak point f6. Bishop is under fire as well. Bishop is saved. Bishop f4, and with that, white is completing development. Well, the rooks are now connected. e5 is secure. This queen, doing a queen comparison, or really, uh, we, we're starting to see the white pieces really drift towards the king side, right? Uh, these, these minor pieces are really swarming in towards the king. We have a lot of pieces just camping out on the queen side, far away from helping defend any of the king side squares. Queen c8, and now we have this short little move, this small move, h3, securing the queen. One of the ideas behind queen c8 is to exchange off this half-dead pawn for a super strong pawn on e5. Black's idea is to play d6, threatening a in the exchange of d and e pawns, and also a queen exchange. This queen is currently unprotected, some security now for white with h3. So if in this position d6, we can take. And there's no fear of, you know, we don't have to deal with this queen takes queen move. What would be the better side here of d6? So what does black do? Knight e7. Now isn't this knight getting in the way of the rook? This knight is also a second rank piece. Let's avoid that exchange. The knight drops back to a nice square. This is a much better post for the knight when compared to this guy on e7. Keeps pieces on the board when you have some space. Continuing, bishop c6. Lending some support to d7, maybe right around this point, now that a few more moves have been in there, there is this threat to simply regain the material and simply be better. Rook d6 in the game. There are a lot of weaknesses. d6, f6, h6, all dark squares. Notice the pieces, how they swarm into these weak points. Knight g7, rook f6. And in the game here, we had queen b7. If the knight returned here, there wouldn't be anything better than the rook uh, returning back to d6, I, I believe. And I don't know that we would have some repetition, I believe, there would be a bishop to h6 move eventually. This happens in the game right now exactly. Queen b7, bishop h6. Knight d5, so our first peace exchange on move 24, quite a bit. Took quite a bit for that to happen. And now we have rook to d1, getting the last piece involved. Meanwhile, the rook on a8, not really doing a whole lot. Queen... Kind of specific to the queen side. Much more evasive pieces over here. Continuing, knight to e6. The dark square bishops are now gone. And now white finds it much easier to make use of these weakened squares without that master defender around. So queen h4. Bishop c6. Queen h6. Rook e8. And here we go. Got a lot of major pieces occupying the weak points. All of them are occupying the weak points in Black's camp. There is a lot of influence on 7th rank squares. And let's not forget this 6th rank as well. Some pressure against G6. Some sacrifices are right around the corner. Bishop takes knight in this position. What are these sacrifices I'm talking about? So just as an example, it's kind of making a passing move. If in this position the knight is not captured, let's say queen c7 as just a quick example, here's one of the sacrifices that's available to white. Rook takes knight, removing a key defender of knight g5. So after pawn takes knight g5, checkmate next. Recapture in another direction, it doesn't matter. There's three different ways you can recapture here, and all of them would be met with knight g5. So this move, knight g5 once more, no good way to defend at this point. d5 could be met with chop, chop, and a very nice sequence here, picking up the queen. 
Serious tactical opportunity here for White. This knight needs to be removed, and is, on this move 29. Chop, chop. An imbalance is now present. Bishop versus knight position. Queen a6. This queen is now going to get quite active. Striking at a2 at the moment. White doesn't care about those pawns, though. The queenside pawns are irrelevant. White is pursuing an attack against the king. Also, this is another opportunity, another instructional moment here, where white now has the option to pick up that d7 pawn. Why not? Why not take that d7 pawn? Let's have a look. If rook takes d7 here, there can follow queen a4, and after the rook reacts to the threat, there's now rook to d8. What is happening here? White regained the material, but because that d-pawn is no longer around, black is able to now exchange what was a very passive rook on e8. It's now getting active, right? It's going to be able to exchange itself off for this active piece. And that's one of the downsides with winning a pawn in this position. It's that you release these passive rooks. These rooks are not contributing. Taking the pawn allows the rooks to contribute. White presses with h4. This is a very nice way to uh, break down the king position. A lot of pressure on g6. Sacrifices on g6 are close by. So as an example, as an example, if this queen just tries to go into vacuum cleaner mode, taking on a2, Ignoring this h5 idea. Taking on b2. Here we go. Chop. 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 A lot of chops. And in the end, this is a winning attack for Team Black. This is serious. The sacrifice on g6. Queen takes here. The bishop sneaks in. Mate in 6. King here. Mate in 1. Okay. The queen can't just, you know, go into Pac-Man mode has to do something about this idea. Queen a5 is looking to scoop up this pawn. Two moves, hitting with check. Queen takes e5. What does white do? Stops the queen from pivoting on e1 altogether. Black tries to get at this pawn one way or the other. c4 is interesting. Right? It opens up the queen's eyes, but another way to view this move, c4 is that it uh, reduces the quality of the e6 knight. Now, why do I say this? It, well, it's because with the pawn on c5, that connects really well with the knight. There's this really nice knight to d4 move that can show up in many variations, but now this is no longer, uh, you know, it doesn't have that support with c4 on board. So, rook d5 in the game, need to defend that point, Queen now slips in. There's one very active piece for Stockfish 8. King g2. The, the queen is that piece that's active. So king g2, c3. Some exchanges here on the queen side. And now h5, to be expected. Breaking down the g6 point. Rook e7 is prepared to add some lateral defense, so... For example, if capture is like this, there's a recapture. Also, the rook is defending d7. As things are changing here, uh, you know, there are plenty of other situations where capturing d7 could turn out to be quite good. This is, this is getting to be one of those points, so you can't just give up this pawn in this position. Rook e7 is there to defend. And now, a bit of a reposition here with the bishop. Where would you like to have that bishop ideally? b3. Nice secure square, defended by the pawn, and, a, and opposite that king. One piece, uh, one way or the other, will be pinned to the king. So, queen e1 in the game. Bishop b3, rook d8. We're having a bit of a reorganization uh, at this stage. Rook f3. Uh, Black has defended well against this idea to capture and, 
you know, the the rook is there. It's a pretty strong defender against the seventh rank squares. So the pieces are repositioning to more central locations. And I really like this next move, queen to d2. What is this doing exactly? It's allowing this pawn to become a great thorn in black side. I believe the first piece that occupied the h6 square in this game was a bishop. Next we had the queen. And now we're going to have a pawn. Notice those three pieces I just mentioned. What do they do well? They control the g7 square. They take away this key flight square from the king. This allows for plenty of different back rank mating ideas. So the queen drops back d2, h6 right around the corner, and, you know, you, you want to do more with the queen, right? You want to do two, two or more aggressive things if possible. Uh, well, here's one aggressive thing. There's some pressure against d7. It's not just about clearing the way for h6. Queen g4 in the game. Bishop d1 questioning the rook, or questioning the queen post. If queen takes pawn, there's rook takes f7. Queen e4, staying central. There is a pin there. h6 on board. So now black needs to be on the lookout for back rank mates. Flight square is taken away from the king. This is a strong, strong pawn. Knight c7, rook d6. It seems like this pawn could be won. That's not true. If queen takes pawn in this position, rook e3, and then f4, distract the queen from defending the rook. White would win. And if rook takes pawn, there's a problem there. This d7 pawn that has been ignored a couple times will be ignored no more. White could smash through here, and there's just all sorts of stuff happening. Many back rank squares being observed by the white queen, pressure on f7, and eventually white would be able to force black into a giant ball, something like this, taking advantage of pins and something like this, and black would be dead. This would be a cool way to see the game end straight to mate. Okay, the idea here, don't take on e5 with either piece or you're in big trouble. Knight e6 in the game. Bishop b3 gives up the e5 pawn. Queen takes e5. White is down two pawns at this point, but has really good pieces. If you do a rook comparison, all of the white pieces are better. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not the queen. Both rooks, both white rooks are better than the black rooks. The bishop is better than the knight. The white king is more secure than the black king. If there's any piece that's better that black has, it's the queen. It's in the center, but it's the only active piece that black has. And this post is immediately brought into question, rook d5. Surprisingly enough, the queen doesn't have many good options here. Uh, if queen to e4 in this position, it seems appealing, stays in the center, puts white in a pin, but it allows queen to c3. And this is something that black should not allow to even uh, allow the, the white queen to patrol this dark diagonal and coordinate well with this thorn pawn. This places a restriction on the knight, and this knight is not stable. Could be knocked out, and mate is close by. So the queen needs to make a move where she keeps control over g7. She has a couple options. One is a1, and the other is h8. If the queen goes to a1, she could kind of be cut out of the game with rook c3. It's a surprising move, but the queen now is kind of without a good square. She only has b1 available, and that could maybe be taken away in just a little bit. She's very short on squares if she goes to a1. She's vulnerable to attack. So, in this game, black decides on queen h8, ensuring that the queen will be able to observe g7 directly, um, and you can't get at the queen. You can't attack the queen. So what does Alpha Zero do next? Hits black where they're a little bit vulnerable. 
Queen b4, rook is under fire, knight c5, and I haven't thrown any pop quiz, any pop quizzes your way. Here's one for you right now. Alpha zero to move, white to move, what would you do in this position? Feel free to pause the video. Okay. Alpha zero goes with an exchange sacrifice, takes out the knight, and this bishop, without the knight on e6, increases in value. Does a wonderful job interacting with the rook. And more than that, we have this deeper idea. Queen h4, insisting on striking at, the, on striking at that rook. And one more detail, and that is the follow-up move after the rook is defended. Rook f6. Do you see what just happened? With this last move, black has killed both king and queen. The two most valuable pieces that black has are now dead by the rook and the pawn. Okay, the queen also factors into this equation. The queen is necessary to defend the rook, but that job will soon uh, be transitioned to the pawn. The pawn will have that role to defend that rook. It's going to run up to g5, and the queen will be free to do whatever she wants. Black is in a giant pickle. Can't get out of it. Black at this stage is now down to making pawn moves, just back and forth moves. There is no rescuing this cornered queen. Rook f8 in the game. Pressure is on f7 with all white pieces, three attackers, three defenders, must remain on this point. Black is down to just pawn moves, basically, or, you know, this pawn is going to have to move before this rook can move. A5 in the game, G4, D5, we could just take that. Rook D7, Bishop C4. And from here we have A4 in the game. This is an interesting moment. Uh, I would have liked to have seen this uh, this game end uh, there's, there's a cool variation here. Instead of a4, if rook d4 is played, pop quiz, what would you do as white? Feel free to pause the video. White would have this winning shot. If rook d4 was played, white would have rook takes f7. This would, would have been a beautiful finish. Rook takes queen and rook g7. That's a double check and mate. Notice the power once more of this thorn pawn. In the game, we have a4. This rook is now super glued in there. On f6, seven points are restricting the king and queen. Continuing, we have a3. A nice dropping back here, queen f3. Maintaining pressure on f7. Ready to pick up the pawn. And one other key detail. Sneaking into c6 is pretty deadly. In the game, we have rook c7 defending, and white simply picks up the pawn. What if black defends the pawn? Well, queen c6, you see the threat? What would you do as white after the move rook to e7? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, white would have another spectacular shot. Rook takes g7. Pawn takes rook. Queen takes pawn. Don't try to take the queen. There's a pin. And mate. Once more. That pawn on h6. Deadly. Rook c7 in the game. There goes the a pawn. And Stockfish just gives up the queen for the rook at this stage. Uh, you know, I guess this is the best way to prolong the game here, giving up the queen for the rook. If you don't do that... Uh, it's just a lot of back and forth with the rook. The queen could return, the pawn can bolt. So the queen just gives up herself for the, the rook at this stage, and we just get a few more moves in here. And after a4, Stockfish 8 resigns. The evaluation is off the charts. At the moment, it's reading mate in 14, mate in 13 now, mate in 12. I think it gets down to mate in, mate in 11. Anyhow, there's just nothing to do here for Stockfish. Uh, one of the rooks always has to watch out for the back rank, and another rook has to watch out for a sacrifice on f7. 
So as an example, rook a7, a5, you know, if you take this pawn, there's a shot like this. Chop, check, and checkmate. So if this did continue, we had maybe something like this. There's even something fancy like bishop to b7 and then queen to b6. This rook is dead. So plenty of different ways to uh, proceed at this stage, but this is where Stockfish 8 resigns after this move 60, a4. So what more to add with this one? Stockfish, you underestimate the value of thorn pawns in proximity to your king.